Well, here we go. Was Phoebe a deaconess? I fear that this subject will probably cause me to lose a few friends, but I must declare what the Bible has to say. On the basis of Romans chapter 16, verse 1 through 2, some are contending that Phoebe was a church official, uh, more commonly called a deacon. The church was to assist her, allegedly implying her authority over the church, and she had been a helper of many, purportedly suggesting that she had exercised authority, discipline, and supervision over men in the church. All of this supposedly proves that Phoebe was some sort of authoritarian figure in the early church. However, if I am instructed to help Phoebe, does that make her in charge of me? Older brothers are often told by the parents to help the little brother. Does this make the little brother the boss or leader or the elder of the older brother? Is Phoebe now my leader simply because Paul wants some people to help her out? This would be quite the stretch of reasoning to make her some sort of administrator. They will argue that there were women prophets in the Bible. So that makes it okay for women to be preachers in the church. Yet when Miriam prophesied, all the women went with her in Exodus chapter 15 to sing a song. The men didn't. The men didn't follow Miriam. Her ministry wasn't for the whole group. Prophesying is merely to proclaim that something is going to happen. It doesn't mean, please open up the scriptures and teach us. Once you point that out to them, they will quickly move on to another prophetess named Holda. And although Holda was a prophetess, the solitary record of her prophesying involved some men going to her where they communed privately, and that will be found in 2 Kings chapter 22 and 2 Chronicles chapter 34. They asked her to verify if they had the right documents. She verified that they indeed had the right papers. Well, thanks, Holda. See you later. Then they will bring up the woman at the well, and they'll say, She carried the gospel and preached to the whole town of the Samaritans. But of course, what she was doing is merely testifying and giving a witness of what the Lord has done. Every Christian should do that. Women can and should witness to all people for Jesus Christ. They should have a ready testimony, but a testimony is not a sermon. A testimony is not opening the book of Jeremiah and expounding what chapter 7 is all about. That would be teaching. Now, Anna was a prophetess who departed not from the temple. And you find that in Luke chapter 2. In describing the temple, Josephus says there was a partition built for the women that separated them from the men. This was the proper place wherein they were to worship. There is no proof that she publicly prophesied to mixed audiences. And yes, Deborah was a prophetess of the hill country of Ephraim, but there is no indication that she publicly proclaimed God's message to the multitudes. Rather, the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. She gave prophetic judgments as a mother in Israel. The fact that she judged at all is a dramatic commentary on the spiritual decay of the Israelites during this period. And Deborah's song laments this woeful condition. Then they'll give you the culture argument. This is their favorite. They will assert that Paul's limitations upon women were given in view of the Greco-Judaic culture of his day, and that they are not binding in our modern society where such cultural elements are lacking. There are three New Testament contexts where the apostle discusses the distinctive roles of men and women. They are 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and 1 Timothy chapter 2. A summary of these passages reveals that Paul's inspired reasons for feminine subjection were based upon the order of creation and women's deception by Satan. Culture was not a factor in those contexts. Culture was not a factor for Adam and Eve. 
There was no culture. It's two people in a garden. There's no culture there. When Paul discusses authority within the home in Ephesians chapter 5, he appeals to God's creation of Adam and Eve. And that can be found in Genesis chapter 2 as the basis for his instruction. In fact, it is clearly evident that the authority within the home and within the church is grounded upon the same facts of history. Accordingly, if women can demand a place of equal leadership with men in the church, by the same reasoning, no wife today would be bound to be in subjection to her husband. Now, some might delight in this conclusion, but those who fear God will continue to serve the Creator with honor and dignity, consistent with divinely assigned roles. And now some scripture to look at, 1 Peter chapter 3. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Do you have a quiet spirit? When you hold a conversation, is it chaste? Is it polite? Is it calm? Is it rational? Or are you out hollering with the men? Solomon went searching for wisdom in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. One man out of a thousand men may be wise. This is very rare. But no woman was found that Solomon could classify as wise. The detractors will say, that's because they didn't have schools for women back then. But being wise is not something taught in school. Otherwise, Europe and North America will be the wisest among the whole planet's population. In Isaiah chapter 3, it says, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. God is talking to his people through the prophet Isaiah, and his message for his people is that a bunch of women are running and ruling over you. Those children are keeping you, the grown men, down. Even women are keeping the men down, and this kind of leadership is in error. Read the text. Was I just making it all up? Do you think God just doesn't understand how wonderful women leadership is? According to God, if women and children are leading you, then you are in error and your path leads to destruction. But you're so smart and godly, you, you keep on trying to straighten God out. Now ask yourself this question. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, then why aren't you upset about these things like God is? Is it the same spirit that the prophets had? They which lead thee cause thee to err. Oh no, she's leading us into the kingdom of God. They which lead thee cause thee to err. Oh no, no, she's guiding us in all Christian ways. They which lead thee cause thee to err. No, 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 she's preaching and teaching the congregation. They which lead thee cause thee to err. The other churches think we are progressive and tolerant. And destroy the way of thy paths. In Isaiah chapter 9 it says, For the leaders of this people caused them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men, neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for every one is an hypocrite, and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. 
if you are a young man and you put all these women up in the pulpit, God will have no joy in the young men doing this. Now you can say amen all you want and preach it, sister, but God will have no joy in you by doing that. How can the husband of a woman preacher sit under her preaching the word of God? The Bible says if a woman wants to learn something about God's word, she should ask her husband at home. It doesn't say for the husband to ask the wife. Read your Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. God here is not the author of confusion, and if a woman is the preacher or teacher, then God says this is confusion. So let's look at this word silence. Notice that we don't need to run to some dead foreign language like Greek to learn anything. We don't need the graveyard of Greek to let us know what the word silence is. We can use the Bible scripture with scripture to figure out what the silence means. This silence can't mean prayer because Anna prayed in the Gospel of Luke. And it can't mean don't sing because women in the congregation sang in Ezra chapter 2. So women are making sounds when they sing. This silence is not referring to that. What could the silence then refer to? Well, we need to go to a Greek lexicon. No, no, we just need the Bible. We just keep reading, and there it is. See how the Bible cleared up the Bible? Have you ever heard someone say, tonight, our guest speaker is? And then that person would take center stage and begin to speak to the crowd. Women are not to be master of ceremonies. There is no women's night at the local church if the whole church is present. And I realize that saying this will lead to the loss of many friendships which explains why this kind of teaching is seldom heard. It takes a lot of soul searching to present the Bible in its proper context. It's one thing to be ridiculed by the world, but to be shunned and avoided by so-called Christians can be very brutal. But let God be true and every man a liar. In today's Christianity, you will be asked to leave if you differ from the group. But enough about this social fellowshipping. Let's get back to the Bible. Preachers don't dwell on these subjects and, quite frankly, avoid them for fear of upsetting the women of the congregation, and more importantly, his wife. If the preacher dares to open his mouth about these issues, he's going to hear about it when he gets home. He also has to count the cost. Taking a stand will cost him. He's afraid that his bed is going to get cold at night and very lonely. So he keeps his yap shut, also realizing that women put in the most money in the offering plate. Now, I told you this was going to be a rough one. So what did the apostle think about letting women speak in the church? He said, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. If the same Holy Spirit lives in you that lived in Paul, why don't you feel as strongly as he does? He thought it was a shame. Now, some women have a desire to be in charge of things. Not all of them, but I'm speaking in general terms, of course. Just as many men have a lazy desire to let the women be in charge so we can goof off. Uh, if you're a man and you're listening to this, you're probably agreeing with me right now. This is the behavior that the devil is in favor of. Men shirking their responsibility so that women feel the need to fill in the gaps. You probably thought I was just going to blame the women, but men are actually to blame here. The subject is never, I wonder if a woman could do this job. The subject is, what boundaries did the Lord set down for us to obey? Are we operating inside those boundaries? In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. 
But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the men, but to be in silence. But Sally feels that God wants her to be the preacher. But I suffer not a woman to teach. She said the Lord told her to teach the whole church. But I suffer not a woman to teach. That was a long time ago. The Lord didn't intend for it now. But I suffer not a woman to teach. The other churches are allowing it. But I suffer not a woman to teach. But the scriptures say a woman is to teach under certain situations and to certain people. And she is limited in what she says. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior, as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blaspheme. So the woman teacher should be aged. Now some might have a problem admitting to how old they are. But if you want to teach, you have to be considered aged. Now if you spend all of your time trying to doll yourself up so that you can blend in with the teenage girls, then you should probably refrain from being a teacher and your audience is not the entire congregation. Your subject matter is daily living and how to treat your husband and children, how to keep a steady household. If your husband needs to have some people over for biblical studies, can he do so with a clean area? If a woman doesn't teach in this style only, what happens according to God? Well, according to God, the word of God should not be blasphemed. Well, those verses do sound rough, but they only applied to church business meetings. Where does the phrase church business meeting appear in scripture? Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach. God is against that woman teaching, but they don't let that stop them from continuing to argue. In fact, they love to argue. What you have today is a large amount of women that are disobedient to the scriptures that tell them to get married. You don't believe me? Well, then read 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, Guide the house. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Some women, instead of learning from the husband at home, are seeking to learn about the Bible from universities or 12-part conferences. I could get my biblical answers from the university, or I could put up with a husband who could instruct me like Jesus wants me to. Hmm. But if I submitted to a husband, He'd expect me to be old-fashioned, and I couldn't maintain my sassy lifestyle. Why should I allow that to cramp my style? I do like being in charge of all my decisions. A husband would have too much input. But that college professor, he wouldn't. Now, a long time ago, a woman was faced with a challenge. She was instructed to not eat the fruit of a certain tree. This tree would teach her many things, things she would soon be able to teach her husband. She could now tell her husband that he's naked. This is something that Adam didn't know, and it is this context that Paul forbids women to teach men. It was historical, not cultural. The devil got the woman off by herself. Not that a woman can't take a walk without the man around, but as soon as the discussion turned to theology, she should have said, wait just a minute, I want my husband to hear what you just said. Going against this simple plan of how to handle situations was a disaster. A similar warning is found regarding women not having a head covering. The verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 about women praying without their heads being covered wasn't referring to women putting on a hat in church meetings. 
Rather, the husband is their covering. There is something about that woman going about religious activities without the covering of a man that tempts the angels. This is where Eve didn't have her covering, Adam. And the devil just slithers right up to her and starts in talking to her. The angels that fall in Revelation chapter 12 haven't fallen yet. This is still a future event. Sadly, many Christians assume that falling already took place and it happened thanks in part to a book written in 1667 by John Milton. Milton was probably a nice guy, but he misread the Bible and assumed that the one-third falling to have already happened. It hasn't, but it will happen in Revelation chapter 12. Now, why is this all important? Well, we will never understand everything right now, but God has given us plenty of verses to warn us. Maybe we should heed them. And while we're at it, maybe we should heed 2 Timothy 3, 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Yo, you just want us to be barefoot and pregnant. Well, I kind of think pregnancy is a blessing. There's a lot of women that would, would like to get pregnant, but they, for some reason, haven't been able to. And as far as barefoot, being barefoot is great. And don't, don't most women's shoes hurt your feet? In my 12-step seminar, I explain why it's okay for women to teach men. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You're just an old-fashioned sexist. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way, and walk therein? And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. And it gets worse. All of these so-called women pastors and deacons are strengthening more feminists by merely existing. For example, John Piper said that women shouldn't be seminary professors because they train men to be pastors. This, of course, sent many of the opposing side to circle the wagons and come to the defense of women to be leading and teaching men. Introducing this one woman who posted, her name is Sarah, and she says, I'm not a theologian, so I'm not going to break down the Greek words and the context to show you why he's wrong though plenty of other theologians have done so. I'm just a small woman with a big voice in my soul that doesn't come from me. Well, if this voice doesn't come from her, I, I wonder where it does come from. When I read Piper's comments, I was a little angry and a lot sad. So right off the bat, she says we should go to the Greek, and then we would understand how wrong we are. This is typical and means that they can't handle what God said in English, let alone Greek. I was sad for sisters like me with big voices in their soul. They know they're meant to share who get shut up and shut out on the regular. I doubt it. This is 2018 and no one is shutting you up and shutting you down on the regular. You are not a victim and you have not been persecuted. Try taking a stand on my side of the aisle, then you, we can talk about persecution. The creation story in Genesis says that in order to reflect God's image in women, God created men and women, so just like Mao Zedong's insistence that women hold up half the sky, there should be a similar statement in the Christian tradition that says, women hold half the voice of God. So you think quoting from the communist leader, Chairman Mao, is in favor of women preaching. Not even the drugged up Beatles wanted anything to do with him. Because breath is breath, air is air, but it sounds different flowing through a flute than it does a bassoon. Gather around, boys and girls, we're going to learn about musical instruments now. A string is a string, and wood is wood, but sound resonates differently in the heart of a violin than it does in the heart of a cello. Insisting in spite of more accurate 
and generous interpretations of Scripture that men be the only voices heard from the pulpits of our churches is like an orchestra that only has cellos and bassoons. It's heavy. It's masculine. It's only half the story. It's only half the notes. So now you're wanting more generous interpretations. You aren't taking the simple meaning of words from God's Bible. And you don't want to hear God's words if they sound masculine. The orchestra we have is incomplete. There are notes missing that we don't even know are missing because we haven't ever heard them. We are deprived of hearing the equally masculine feminine voice of the God who loves us all. Can you give me a chapter and verse where God has an equally masculine and feminine voice? According to you, God's voice is like a flute. For some reason, I expected a trumpet sound, but what do I know? I await further instructions, O oh, wise teacher of the Bible. So let's seat the rest of the orchestra. Let's let the breath of love flow through flutes and bassoons, through violins and cellos, until we do. Half the notes are missing, half the seats are empty, half the sky is falling, and half your brain is missing. And now we quickly go to their last gasp, their last ace in the hole. This is their last chance to try to prove their point. They'll go to Galatians chapter 3 and pull out this tired old reasoning the neither male nor female argument. Since there's neither male nor female, then these rules prohibiting women don't apply to anyone. Well, the context of the passage is salvation, but keep arguing. Your goal is to wear us down. We'll find we need men to approve of us anyway. Our will comes first, and they'll find a weak need preacher who only has one type of message. Now, for those of you that are upset after seeing this or reading this, please know that I am not your enemy. Embrace the boundaries that God has put in place for everyone's benefit. These are here to help us. If you are a woman that has been seeking a good Christian husband to be the spiritual leader of the family, don't get discouraged. Keep praying to God and quote his word and humble yourself. God can still supply even at this late hour.